Our next speaker is Dr. Abnett, who's uh, here from the National Institutes of Health. And I have to say, I'm really impressed at how we've had this great uh, input from many people from the NIH here today, um, and how important it is for us to hear their views. He's going to talk about something that we've been touching on various times in, in, um, in this conference about uh, resource-limited countries and their uh, challenges facing upper GI cancers. So thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here, and I've really enjoyed the conference. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, gastric cardiac cancer, which is something that we haven't heard a lot about, and it's something that's of uh, a lot of importance to my research portfolio. Uh, and I want to try to share some of the insights that we've gained over the years. So uh, everybody here is working on gastric cancer to one degree or another or is familiar with it, but just for those of you who might not be sure, the cardia is just the top few centimeters of the stomach. And in, I'm going to tell you about how the etiology of gastric cardiac cancer is different from non-cardiac cancer within Asia. Now, I don't think that would be a surprise if I said outside of Asia, because we think of gastric cardiac cancer as some sort of a combination of GE junction cancer, hard to separate from esophageal adenocarcinoma, and more or less similar to esophageal adenocarcinoma, but that's not the case in Asia. Uh, and, in fact, it even gets more complicated because gastric cardiac cancer in Asia is different from the gastric cardiac cancer, gastric cardiac cancer we see in Western populations. And by Western populations, I mainly mean the well-studied populations in Europe, the U.S., and Australia of mostly people of European descent. Uh, in China, the geographical patterns of gastric cardiac cancer actually closely follow esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the registries in China don't do a really great job of separating cardia and non-cardia, uh, but that's going to be changing and we're expecting to have a lot better data in the near future. So these are maps from back in the 1970s of cancer mortality in China. And we can see that there's a very strong concentration of esophageal cancer in that red section in central China. And that's a mountain range called the Taihung Mountains. And for uh, since the early 1980s, NCI has been doing studies in this area. We have a cohort of 30,000 uh, people that we've been following, Chinese farmers, since that time. And so far, we've collected over 3,500 esophageal squamous cell carcinomas. So more than 10% of the population has developed esophageal cancer in this area. In that region, there's also a fair bit of gastric cancer, and 80% of all the gastric cancers in that area are in the gastric cardia, more than 2,000 that we've collected, and much higher rates than we see of non cardiac cancer. That's repeated in some of the other areas where gastric cancer is common in China, although in most areas of China, uh, non cardiac cancer is the, by far the dominant uh, location. So when we started looking at these and trying to understand the etiological differences between these, because that's the primary goal of my research, uh, we start and we have this cohort where we have lots of squamous cell carcinomas, lots of cardiac cancers, and enough non-cardiac cancers to make comparisons. So I think one of the most important ones we can make, especially for today's meeting, is the role of Helicobacter pylori. So this is a paper that we did using the ATBC cohort. This is a cohort of white men in Finland, and in this cohort, when we look at uh, uh, serology for H. pylori, we see what you might expect, a very strong association uh, of about eight for being seropositive. And if you look at what they call gastric cardiac cancer, it was, our results were 0.3, a strong protective association, suggesting that not having HP increased your risk for, for car uh, cardiac cancer. Now, the way the fins call cardiac cancer includes uh, tumors that are up to three centimeters above the junction, and so essentially this is really a, an extensive GE junction combined endpoint. Uh, they do have some, of course, adenocarcinomas that are farther up in the tube, but uh, so few that we didn't include them in this study. Uh, and something similar has been seen in many other studies. Usually it's called esophageal adenocarcinoma, and in almost always the case is that if you're HP positive, your risk is lower. But in many of these studies, it's been almost impossible to separate out what's a cardiac cancer from uh, what's a uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma, and that's pretty much true throughout most of the studies in the Western world. 
Now, when we go to China, we see a very different situation. Here in our cohort, we see we tested a subset of our cases, and we see that for squamous cell carcinoma, there's no association with being seropositive. For cardiac cancer, the, the uh, hazard ratio is 1.6, significant, and for non-cardiac cancer, it's 1.6 and significant. So we see really the same level of association for cardiac and non-cardiac cancer, so suggesting that HP is causing cardiac cancer, at least in central China. Uh, the, the hazard ratios are much lower here, but that's not because HP is less important, it's just because almost everybody's infected, and when you have very high infection rates, the hazard ratios are going to look lower. Uh, here is a study that we've done in uh, Central Asia. This is a study coming from Iran. So after working for many years in China, we thought it would be really useful to start working in another population that has very high rates of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, and we started working with the uh, uh, gastroenterology center in Tehran and working up in northeastern Iran where they have very high rates of this cancer. This is from a population-based case control study, and this is essentially a series of gastric cancers. And we have, we collected 142 that were in the cardia and 103 non-cardia, and then there was a bunch more that were either overlapping or unspecified. And when we did a serologic test on them, we ended up with something similar to what we saw in China. Now, we were using Michael, Michael Polita's uh, assay, which is very, very sensitive, and you end up getting very high rates of uh, HP infective, uh, infection when you use that assay. So I have just pulled out the KGA positive part of it today, and you'll see that we have for the cardia 2.1, for non-cardia 3.5, again, quite similar association. So um, we had done a number of studies like this. And at some point, I was kind of starting to feel like a crank because I kept saying, well, I think in Asia, cardiac cancer is caused by HP, even if it isn't in other parts of the world. Um, but I did find some other evidence. And here's a nice systematic review from Korea where they had some studies that had both cardia and non-cardiac cancer. Again, you see the same thing. HP seropositivity has the same association in the cardia and the non-cardia. And after a, uh, enough evidence has accumulated, there have been some other people who are starting to agree with this. So the IARC every once in a while puts out one of these papers where they look at the global burden of cancers attributable to infections, and this is the one from 2012. At that time, they were saying that there was two cancers caused by HP, non-cardiogastric cancer and malt lymphoma. Uh, but in the most recent update, they've added something, and they've added cardiogastric cancer to the list of cancers caused by HP. If you look at what they're saying here, they're saying uh, uh, the number of uh, cast cardi cast gastric cardiac cancers they're estimating is about 180,000 in the world. And because this is a mixture of Western uh, people who shouldn't be, we shouldn't uh, attribute HP to the cause of that cancer, and Asian cardiac cancer, they've estimated a lower fraction, and it's about 36,000. So that would be maybe four or five percent of the cancers that are caused by HP are Asian cardiac cancers. Uh, but I think that this is still could be an underestimate. One, we don't really know the balance between cardiac and non-cardiac cancer in much of Asia. And I think we have very little data from uh, Latin America or Africa where, although gastric cancer is rare, there is still gastric cancer there. And we know that HP infection is ubiquitous. So that's of, uh, of interest of who to blame for gastric cancer and, and making inaccurate estimates, but I think it has other relevance too. And that's because of work like this from Dr. Choi, who unfortunately wasn't here today. And this is his H. pylori therapy study looking at the prevention of metachronous gastric cancer and the importance of doing uh, eradication on people at the time of, of gastric cancer diagnosis. So if cardiac cancer is caused by HP, the question is, is whether or not people are eradicating it. I'm assuming that in many instances in the United States, if you have a cardiac cancer, you don't even think about HP, or you think it's probably was, um, the cancer might be there because the HP was missing. But in Asia, I think you really should think that the HP may have caused the cancer. And that may be also relevant to, to Asian immigrants in the United States. This has been very consistent in both cohort studies and randomized controlled trials. And so I think that this is a really an important question that we consider when thinking about cardiac cancer occurring in, in group, people of different ethnic backgrounds and also uh, geographic backgrounds. Now, we've did other things besides just look at the serology. Here's a study where we did looking at serum pepsinogens. On the left, it's the results for non-cardiac cancer. And this is a prospective cohort study. Uh, and on the right is 
cardiogastric cancer. And the serum uh, one to two pepsinogen ratio is on the x-axis and the odds ratio is on the y-axis. And you can see that as the pepsinogen ratio falls, which is a serological measure of gastric atrophy, that the odds ratio for uh, non-cardiac cancer gets quite high. We see a very similar pattern, although somewhat muted in, uh, not in cardiac cancer. We also looked at squamous cell carcinoma in the study, and there was, that was completely flat. So we've looked at a lot of different risk factors in the NIT cohort, and overall we see lots of different patterns. We see HP for both gastric types of gastric cancer. We saw selenium deficiency was only for squamous cell carcinoma and gastric cardia adenocarcinoma, but not non-cardia. So we see all these patterns. One thing that was quite important for all of them is family history. And as we moved into studying the role of common genetic variation, we also looked at this uh, same question. Here's the paper that we published about 10 years ago, which was a GWAS of both esophageal and gastric cancer in China. And here's the uh, results, looking at the most significant association in the, whole, in the genome for uh, esophageal cancer and gastric cancer. And the SNPs were in a gene called PLCE1, and just because the SNPs are in the gene doesn't mean that the effect is from that gene, but we saw this very strong association. Uh, we were able to replicate this in other sets to push down our p-values, and then we also see this for gastric cancer. Now, I've been saying that we shouldn't combine gastric cancer into cardia and non-cardia, so when we separated it, what we see is that, that that average signal for gastric cancer was, in fact, a super strong signal from the cardia and nothing from non-cardia cancer. So looking at genetic common genetic variants, again, we see that esophageal squamous cell carcinoma and gastric cardia adenocarcinoma are linked in this population. We've gone on to do a much deeper analysis across more of the genome, and there's been other publications from China. And what we see is that so far, we've only found one uh, low, uh, low side that's only associated with cardiac cancer. We see lots of them where it's associated with just non-cardiac cancer, and then we see some where it's both. For example, MUC1, where we see a very strong association for MUC1 SNPs for both cancer types. So moving on to uh, somatic changes, here we don't really have much data. This is from the very nice uh, TCGA paper, and this is the uh, locations of the cancers that were included. I don't think that there was a crosstab for the GE junction cardiac cancers. I think most of these came from uh, uh, white populations. Uh, and even if there were some from Asia, there aren't enough to really tease anything apart. So I think that this is something that we still need to develop more of. And fortunately, we do have a study coming along that's going to address this to some degree, and that's through the uh, mutographs project, a, a grand challenge from Cancer Research UK. This is a very large study that they funded that is provided uh, a, a big consortium of people led by Paul Brennan from IARC and the Sanger Center, and they're bringing together uh, 5,000 tumors to do whole genome sequencing. It's 1,000 apiece for five different cancer sites, and that includes both squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Um, we contributed a lot of the squamous cell carcinomas to their um, effort, and they're working away on those. They did not include car uh, gastric cancer in this project, but we've been able to um, talk to them, and they're going to use some of the excess funding and sequence at least 150 cardiac cancers to be able to come, this, come through the same pipeline. Now, we've got lots more of them that we've collected in China and Iran. Uh, so there is the possibility to, to keep fleshing this data set out as it becomes more accessible. Finally, I just wanted to mention the microbiome. It's something that I've spent a lot of time working on methods, and we think that this may be helpful in understanding uh, both how HP causes cancer and also why we might see some differences in different populations. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to do was figure out how to collect samples. And so here's a study that we published comparing the use of swabs versus uh, biopsies. And we did this by working in a hospital where there's lots and lots of esophagectomies and gastrectomies done, and we opened up the organs, and then we swabbed and we biopsied with it on, on the bench in front of us so we didn't have to put it through the endoscope. And then we did this for both. Uh, squamous tumors and gastrocardia adenocarcinomas, so we could see what the differences were between the two types, and we thought because we were looking at some squamous tissue and some glandular tissue, we really wanted to understand the different characteristics. Uh, we also looked at uh, comparing the tumor and non-tumor that, uh, that we had sampled from, and this just came out just a couple months ago, and this was a relatively small pilot study, but we thought it was interesting. One thing that we saw is that when you're looking at the esophagus, 
The tumor and the non-tumor tissue, whether you biopsy it or you swab it, we really couldn't see much difference in the microbiome, and that may be just because what we're measuring really is just the saliva passing over these tumors. But when we look in the cardia, we see big differences between the tumor and the non-tumor, and there's, it seemed like it was something more was changing. Maybe the glandular tumors are, have more uh, unique uh, uh, habitats for, for different bacteria to take hold. And if we look at a broad level, we can see that for, uh, at the phylum level, you really can't see much going on. But at the genus level, we can see that there's one really big difference between the non-tumor and the tumor gastrocardia, and that's this helicobacter. So when we looked at the normal adjacent tissue in the cardia, we see about 50% of all the sequences are helicobacter. So this is at the time of diagnosis. Uh, most of these people were stage two or three because they were getting surgery. And in the tumor itself, the amount of helicobacter was much less, but we do see that it was quite prevalent in the cardia. Uh, as I said, this is just a pilot study, and we're working to do this on a much uh, larger scale. So uh, the work I shared today was from a large number of collaborators, and uh, I wanna just want to say thank you to everybody for, uh, who contributed to all this work, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. <laughs>